Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the March 28th Board of Selectmen's meeting. Uh, would you all please rise, uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we're going to go into an executive session. Uh, Jason, you have the paper where you can read that? I do. Short, for a short period of time, then we'll reconvene. I make a motion to go into executive session for Mass General Law Chapter 30A, 21A, 2, to conduct con contract negotiations with non union personnel, the fire chief. Okay, the motions are a second. Second. Uh, motion and a second. We'll roll call vote. Uh, Jason? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Bill? Yes. Myself? Yes. Three yes, one absent. Uh, we'll be in uh, executive session. We're going to go in the other room. We will reconvene. Thank you. Okay, thank you for being patient, everybody. Uh, we're back. Uh, we'll, we're at the regular order of business. Uh, public comment. They didn't have anybody uh, indicate they had anything. Uh, approval of warrants. Uh, Jason, do you have those? Yes. I'll make a motion to approve payroll warrant 2239 in the amount of $182,150.89. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Bill uh, Warrant? I'll make a motion to approve Bill Warrant 2239 for $560,319.37, which breaks down to the town bills of $111,316.81, water and sewer $6,756.79, Payroll withholding, $31,529.59. Light bills, $393,494.29. Grants and revolving, $17,221.93. Second. Motion and a second. Further discussion? None. All in favor? All right. Unanimous. Uh, Approval of the minutes, March 14th, 2022, meeting minutes. Anybody read those over? I did. I found them to be in order. Um, so I'll make a motion to approve the Monday, March 14th, 2022, minutes. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Right. Four in favor, one abstention. I abstain. I uh, wasn't here. Appointments. Appointment of Sam Joslin. River Street and Haverhill to the position of Inspector of Animals, effective March 28th, 2022. And we have a, uh, we have a, a letter here from the uh, Department of Commonwealth, Massachusetts Department of Agriculture. Uh, and we want to make a motion for... Uh, yes, I'll make a motion to appoint Sam Jocelyn, 583 River Street, Haverhill, Massachusetts, to the position of Inspector of Animals, effective March 28th, 2022. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. second it. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, what's an what's an inspector of animals? It's in our packet. What do we need it for? It's in our it's Required in our packet. by state law, I believe. It's what in the packet. know about animals. Where's Sam Joslin? I thought he was a building inspector. Building's animals, same thing. I mean, uh, <laughs> no. I don't know. It was the police uh, you know. sergeant the last time. You know. It's a volunteer position. Would you like to be that person? Yeah. 
You can take over. I'm sure Sam is busy. Inspecting animals? How many animals we got in town? You, you'll know after your inspector. How's that sound? <laughs> I'm already the town parking clerk or whatever, you know. <laughs> By the way, you go. Fields officer. And you've been doing a great job with that. Yeah. No one gets a parking ticket in town, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to be, you know, not being a wise guy. It's just, we're just doing it because the state says we need one? Yeah, all, we've always had an inspector of animals. All right, if he wants it, he can have it. No further discussion from me. Okay. Uh, well, all in favor? All right. Unanimous. More red tape. Thank you. Uh, vote to the board. Vote to approve ballot language for fiscal year 23 budget override. We have a uh, we have a note going out to the town clerk to approve the uh, warrant. Uh, it'll, it'll read, shall the town of Grove be allowed to pass an ex, uh, an, an assess in addition hasn't been filled in. In real estate and personal property tax for the purpose of paying the Pentucket Regional School District annual assessment for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2022. And this was is for the, the ballot question and it'll be a yes or a no vote. Uh, I, I have a question. We need a motion first before we have a discussion. Uh, I'll make a motion to accept the language presented here for the uh, ballot. Okay, is there a second? Second. And a second. I have a question. Uh, I don't know if you can answer it, Rebecca, but if uh, this is for the, uh, the ballot question at the ballot box, uh, if, if this fails at the uh, town meeting, uh, which would have to be voted on first, uh, would this, uh, uh, this would be just null and void. So the first, the Board of Selectmen had voted to move town meeting to May 23rd. So the first step would be to get this on the election uh, warrant and for a ballot question. If it fails on the ballot question or as a ballot question, it will not be on the warrant for town meeting. Okay. In order to pass, it must be approved both on the ballot as well as annual town meeting. Okay, so either, if either one fails, it fails. All and right. I do have a recommended amount based upon the budget. Yeah, nothing was on here. Um, Everybody understand that? Any further discussion? Mr. Chair. Yeah, Dan, go ahead. Is there any way we could block it from going to ballot? Just block it. I don't, uh, do you have the answer to that? If the, if the Board of Selectmen doesn't approve the warrant. Do you, do you want me to answer? Right, we haven't voted, to, on, we haven't voted on the warrant, have we? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Kathy. Two out of three towns can approve uh, the Pentucket Regional School budget without our vote one way or the other. So I think it's important that we allow our citizens the opportunity to vote at the ballot on this. So that's why we've spent a lot of time looking at the budget to decide how much of that assessment has to go on the override in order to balance our budget. And I think Rebecca is prepared to um, talk to us about the amount that would be on the override. Mr. Chair, um, if it passes at town meeting, then it goes to the ballot, and will it require a, uh, a two-thirds majority or a simple majority? It's a simple majority, but we're going to the ballot first, yep. and then town meeting May 23rd. West Newbury is meeting in June. Their town meeting is until June, but I don't yeah. think they have a ballot override. So Merrimack and us will be the first to have the ballot overrides around May, that we're about the same date, I think. Are we the same date as Merrimack, our ballot vote, or not? I'm, I'm, I thought so, but I'm not. It's close. What is the date of the town meeting? Their town meeting is April 25th. No, uh, our town meeting. Oh, our town meeting has been voted and moved to May 23rd. May 23rd? Yep. But if it didn't get on the ballot, then it wouldn't get to town meeting, true? You, you would need to get it voted on by the ballot before being on town meeting or you need to get it in town meeting before voting and then also vote on the ballot you're going to either need to have an extra town meeting or an extra uh, election do we have to put it on the, the ballot? date of the town the dating of the town election is may 2nd may 2nd, may 2nd i keep saying the fifth. Yeah. May 2nd. i'd like to stop it any way i can <laughs> so if it, if if it if we don't have to put it on the ballot and that well two out of three towns can vote it one well, way or the, the other, the, the, so that if I we don't, don't I don't think Merrimack's got to, you know. But yes, but 
West Newbury is not voting at the ballot, only Merrimack and Groveland are. So yeah. if we don't give our citizens a chance to vote, their voice doesn't get heard. I'm afraid they're going to stack the town meeting like they do. It'll be like 52 people show up and walk out when they get what they want. So but I'm again, not a the, big fan of that the process. Ballot, but again, the ballot it dates. The ballot vote is first. Yeah. So that's the bigger vote. I mean, more people. So all 5,000 people can come out. They could. Well, five. <laughs> you can do an um, absentee ballot. There's a number of ways you can vote. I, I thought an override was a two-thirds uh, majority, so, not yeah. uh, 50 percent. Uh, oh. So if the, the, at the ballot, it, it fails, then it just doesn't go to town meeting, right? That's the end of it. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, any further discussion on that? Well, we need to vote the amount for the ballot. Do we have an, an amount, I thought? The proposed amount is $427,838. 427838 Correct. Yes. And that would be consistent with what we have historically spent on our education budget, which is about 64% of our budget. And what would uh, that, the average household would that raise the taxes? So it's about 1900, well, 1956 per a month. year. 1956? 1,956 per capita a year. Yep. And then for the actual average single family tax bill impact would be $178.57. dollars mm -hmm. for a household. Okay, somebody want to make a motion with the uh, uh, 427-838? Yes, um, I'll make a motion. Can I just stipulate to the language that's already been written? And the amount would be $427,838. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair, just a point of clarity. We're just approving it going to the ballot. We're not voting for favorable action in any way. Correct. That's correct. correct. Thank you. That's correct. Any further discussion? None. All in favor? All right. Unanimous. Next order of business presentation Clean the River Project. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike, Mike Batcher? Bacher. Bacher? Yeah. That was close. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Of the board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about the Clean River Project and the exciting grant that we have received for the town of Groveland. Can you flip a slide for me? So the Clean River Project is a nonprofit organization founded in 2005 uh, by Rocky Morrison, who's here with us today. Mm -hmm. He's been here before. Yes. Thank you. And their mission, our mission, uh, is to provide safer, uh, clean and safer uh, drinking water for the people and a better habitat for wildlife around the river and the shoreline. So point of fact, 600,000 people draw their drinking water out of the Merrimack River. The Clean Roger River Project approaches their mission both through direct action and through community awareness. Um, the grant that we're here to talk about, maybe I'll just... Just to flip this slide. Can you flip the slide for me? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> the grant that we're here to talk about was granted by the Essex County Community Foundation mm -hmm. and was just awarded last month. The Clean River Project made applications some time ago. And the funds provide almost $23,000 specifically for Groveland shoreline cleanup. This is sufficient to cover a two-week period, two-week cleanup period, and that would include two weekend days of public volunteer activity. We can uh, have groups come by arrangement during weekdays, things like Boy Scouts, maybe Haverhill High would like to contribute. I know they use the Pines as their launching point for their rowing club. Um, and we're appealing to local businesses to help support those volunteer activities with donations of food and water. 
Um, I've already started talking to some of the local businesses and have gotten some favorable responses that they're eager, eager to pitch in. This is a great opportunity for community building and bring some uh, uh, awareness of the terrific resource we have in the Merrimack River, the Pines and Shanahan Field. So I'd love to hear some ideas from the board either now or later about ways that we can help promote the event and get you know a fantastic turnout. I've got some brochures I'll share with you in case you want to get in touch. Thanks. Thank you very much. Great. So if I could get the last slide. Right So at the end of the cleanup period, we will report on, oh no, back up, back up one more, sorry. And one more back, there we go. So at the end of the cleanup period, the Clean River Project will uh, report on the material that's been removed by weight and by count on specific items of hazardous nature. Um, and I think you're going to be surprised by the volume of material that will be taken out during that time period. Literally tons of waste, material we do not want to have in our river, in our community, um, is going to get cleaned up. So we'd also love to, this to be the start of a partnership with the town and would like to you know, plant a seed of developing a, um, a contractual relationship with the town and would be happy to prepare a proposal for coverage for the entire season. Um, and I think you can gauge the value on the results of the cleanup period that we'll get through the grant. If there's any questions, we have Rocky, members of the board, support staff here with us today. Kathleen? Uh, anybody got any questions? Yeah. <laughs> he usually calls on us. <laughs> um, so you said it will take two weeks. You said volunteers on the weekend. So what's happening? Like, are you just going along the shoreline that the town owns? Are you going to be going across people's property? Or I'm just trying to get an idea of how so much shoreline. There'll be, be a variety of, of services provided. Uh, we're going to get uh, our boat or boats a boat or boats out onto the river. Okay. Um, we may, well, first survey the area and then prescribe a cleanup program that's appropriate. We won't be going on people's property. Um, typically, the volunteer activity is low tide shoreline walk. We provide safety equipment and instructions. All volunteers will sign a waiver, um, get uh, some guidance, um, hand uh, picking devices yeah. will be distributed. Nobody touches anything on the riverbanks. And um, we may use a boom, perhaps. Rocky, I don't know if you want to expand. Basically, basically we'll probably have some, uh, the Clean River staff will uh, be. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, this is Rocky. Sure. Hi, Rocky Morrison, president of Clean River Project. Uh, basically, we'll have the uh, Clean River staff that's uh, trained out there during the week in preparation for the weekend for the volunteers to come out. We might bring out some volunteers during the week if there's any, any available, but we pretty much chaperone them with our own equipment, our own boats, and, and we kind of march down the river safely, cleaning up as we go along and removing all the debris. So do you know how much um, shoreline you're planning to cover for Groveland? I should know this, but I don't know. Well, I think We're not that big a town. <laughs> no, I think it's, what, four miles maybe? That sounds about right. Three to four miles, I think. We'll go from the beginning to the end. Okay. And we're going to swipe right down it. And we might drop a couple of containment booms in the water for the CSO matter or any other matter that Haver might dump on us so we're out there cleaning up. So and if there's tires or, you know, our TVs being dumped upstream, that will catch it and hold it until we're done to clean up, and then we'll clean them out at the very end. So, so a boom is a device. Thank you. <laughs> a boom is the device. It's a, it's a catch-all base. It goes out 150 feet like a giant U in the current holes it there and anything that comes around that bend it will get trapped there and it will stay there 
Okay. And basically, we use this, this device up and down the river to contain uh, any matter flowing down trees, whatever. It will grab it. From the smallest thing to the biggest thing, it will grab it and hold it. So we'll, we're going to install two of those. So do you need us to vote anything right now? Or, or I've been reading about this in our emails, and I just wasn't sure what yes. we were expected to do. I no, mean, I, no, uh, no there, there's nothing. Not except to advertise this. This is a grant that's already been secured okay. through the work of the Clean River Project. Mm -hmm. We would like you to think about um, perhaps a matching fund or uh, accepting a proposal for next year. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think matching, matching fund sounds really nice for maybe for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, we can match, you know, we can find some grants, something like that. We could probably match you with the town to keep this process going and keep the shorelines clean and safe. Great. And the grant was 22? Uh, 22. 80. Yes. And um, that, that'll do uh, two weekends. Two, two week. full weeks. Two week. during, full week. during the week, we'll have our staff mm -hmm. working. And if there's a volunteer group that wants to approach us, make a prearranged date during the weekdays, uh, that can be arranged as well. Okay. And they can get a hold of you by the phone number or the email? Yes. I think this is Any fantastic. Any other questions, uh, Bill? I just have one question. Who are the 600,000 people that get the drinking water out of the Merrimack River? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, Hayroll, no, uh, Lawrence, Dr uh, Lawrence, Lowell, Methuen, uh, Drake, it, all of those towns all the way up. That? From Lawrence up, they pump it out and they drink it. Hayroll's going to be in the future. They're going to start. They pump it out and they drink it, but... It, it must go through an extensive oh. filtration system. I would, I would imagine. I would imagine that cleaning it somewhat. Somewhat. <laughs> that explains a lot. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned here that, that you uh, patrol um, and look for illegal uh, dumping. Uh, you mentioned uh, human waste. How much raw? How much raw and treated sewage is dumped into the Merrimack uh, River by? those municipalities that border the river up to uh, uh, Lowell. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you follow that at all? Basically, there's millions of gallons per rainstorm. Every time it rains, there's millions and millions of gallons per city and town all the way up. Haverhill, Lowell, Lawrence, all those, all the way up to Manchester. Every major city is pumping out CSOs, combined sewage overflows. So they're dumping out their plastics, your condoms, your applicator, female applicators, hypodermic needles, street trash. Everything comes out into the Merrimack River, and it ends up all over your shorelines. So why don't they stop that? Because it seems to me you're picking up trash on a dead river if that's what they're doing. If the cities are responsible for continuing to pollute the Merrimack River, then maybe they should stop. This it seems like you're picking off, you're skimming things off the surface and on the uh, borders of the towns. Maybe the municipalities ought to be held uh, culpable, and uh, maybe there ought to be some sort of federal action under the Clean Waters Act to get these guys to stop dumping in our river that people drink, wa drink out of. It's, a, it's an infrastructure question. It of seems course. like an irresponsibility question that people aren't looking at too carefully. So I appreciate what you guys do, but I don't want to uh, 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 diminish it in any way. But if you're just skimming off the surface and all the filth is below the surface, then, you know, we, I, I question, you know. We have pulled, we pull 100 ton a year out of the Merrimack River, and that's upriver, 100 ton per year. We have removed uh, 84 vehicles from the bottom of the Merrimack River. We have another 20 marked ready to come out, but it's just the funds like you're saying. And the state and federal government are not putting one dime into the Merrimack River. So when you talk about the CSO matter and all that, you're right. And it's, it's, it's the cities and towns are the biggest polluters out there. It's cities not, and it's towns not, are the biggest polluters. Yes, as far as the CSO matter and all that, yes, they are the biggest ones. You will not find, uh, you know, local business dumping that waste in. It's usually the cities and towns. Haverhill, Lawrence, Lowell, they're the culprits that are dumping all this plastics and everything all over your shorelines and contamin contamination. Killing the fish, wrecking the water. Yes, yes. But we, if we didn't do what we, if we didn't take the advantage 18 years ago of the step that we're doing today, the river would really be a mess. I mean, we're pulling 100 ton a year of floatable debris, TVs, tires, mattresses, you know, homeless camps are up and down. There's, there's river you wouldn't believe how many homeless camps there are, and they're, they're throwing their trash down the embankments into the river. 
So if we wasn't out there patrolling the river like we do upriver, you would get so much more trash down here. And we, when we talk mattresses, tents, all of that, clothing, uh, someday you should take a ride with me on the boat and I can teach you what's going on upriver that we try to contain and hold back. And what, you know, so. I'll it's, take it's you up on that, but I'd also like to go knock on a few mayor's doors and maybe we can embarrass some of these people that well, they, they, they talk it. about Green New Deals and everything else and then they dump everything in the water that people drink and maybe we ought to expose these people for what they really are in Massachusetts. I'd, I'd be doing. happy to do that. Believe you me. I'll take uh -huh. the boat ride with you. Thank you. We'll have a cup of coffee one day. Thank yeah. you. Um, well, I know um, just recently in February of 2022, the federal government is putting together a past an infrastructure bill for the water, which is going to be in the neighborhoods of a couple hundred million dollars into Haverhill itself, among all the other towns in terms of wastewater treatments. So they're making huge strides in improving that. And on top of that, I mean, you go back to the 50s, there was no regulations, there was no treatment, it was all just dumped in there. So it's a, it's a long and slow process to improve it. And with you guys' help, it definitely, definitely makes it a little bit smoother. Um, how have you done the promotion before to get volunteers and to get the word out? Uh, basically, a lot of social media. A lot of social media. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big yeah. fan of social media. A lot of social media. Uh, you know, uh, still a lot of newspapers, the clipping, stuff like that in the newspaper so forth. Um, you know, getting the word out that way, uh, social media. Uh, but you're right about Lori Trahan has passed that bill, b billions of dollars being into infrastructure, but not one dime is going in to, to prevent, the, the river. to clean the river. Not one dime. So there was a flaw there when they passed all this money to rip up the streets, but not one dime goes into the river to you know, protect, uh, protect the river from what they're doing. So it's an ongoing uh, job. Yes. Anybody else? Uh, wasn't there some legislation proposed, uh, I don't know what happened to it, that uh, are these sewage treatment plants, if they get an overflow, they just dump into the river? Yeah. Uh, wasn't there some, uh, did, did that ever pass? I, uh, I don't remember. Uh, a certain amount uh, discharge into the into the water. It seems it seems kind of ridiculous that people cleaning up the river, but yet these sewage treatment plants are just dumping raw sewage into the river when they get overflow. You can reach out to Diane DeZoglio's office. She did pass a law last year with Charlie Baker, stating that the cities and towns could dump all the sewage they want. The only thing that her office and what they wanted to know is how many millions millions of gallons per rainstorm. Instead of putting a penalty in there you know, a penny, a five cents per gallon, they actually passed the law that they can dump what they want. And the only thing they wanted to know, and Charlie Baker signed this, is how many millions of gallons per rainstorm they're doing, all these towns. And it's sad. It's sad that, that it's, it's a money, I think it's a money-making uh, machine for them. I really don't. It's corrupt. Oh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Anybody else? No. Thank you for... Um coming to our town i don't think okay. we've had you, guys, you here you guys, before you guys so are big winners you know we're coming to your show your show you won and the lottery on this one huh <laughs> and you'll, uh, you'll let us know what uh, what you pluck out of the river sure we'll yeah. give you we'll give you a report on it uh, uh, okay <laughs> thank you thanks thank very you. much thank, thank you, you. Thank, you thank you for, thank you for coming in yes of course uh next uh, auditor's report mike i thought i saw mike here uh is he out in the hallway? So they, we had a meeting once where they talked about, you know, trying to have a flag system because people that use the river, like we used to have a boat and we used to take the kids out. Good afternoon. Well, good evening. Swimming. Are you okay to sit? Sure. sure, go right ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, the floor is yours. <coughs> okay, great. Well, for the record, my name is Michael Nelligan. I'm a partner with Powers & Sullivan. My associate is uh, Laura Stone. She's a manager on the job. And um, so the audit is done. We've issued the final uh, reports to you all. and. Where uh, I've got about five minutes of prepared comments or notes, and um, and then I'll open it up for questions, and we'll stay as long as you'd like us to. 
So um, we did the audit. We do the audit every year in, in two phases. We, we do our planning work and our tested transactions and things like that in the springtime. And then we come in after the books are closed in the fall and do the what we call the substantive testing and verification of all the numbers and all those kind of things. We did the first phase remotely over the course of the late spring and summer. And then we did the, um, the phase three section back. We did that the first week of December, and we did that in person this time. So we're, we're sort of back uh, coming out to meet folks and working at your location. And uh, the audit went very smoothly. We had no issues. Um, we had full cooperation from everybody we dealt with. The only thing that was uh, delayed a little bit was the OPEB valuation this year. We didn't get the report until February 9th, so we're a little behind. We finished basically all of the other audit work prior to that, and then when that came in, we got you drafts of the financials um, about three weeks after we got the OPEB valuation done, and then we issued the finals two weeks after that. So we issued finals on March 15th, and you got the first round of drafts the 1st of, of March. Um, we had no audit adjustments against your books other than what we call the normal gap accruals and the GASB 34 conversion entries. So to, to bring your books from the modified accrual basis of accounting to a full accrual basis of accounting, it requires a number of adjustments to do that. But those are normal uh, um, entries to record fixed assets, compensated absences, OPEB, pension, and things like that that um, you don't do on a norm, on a regular basis on your uh, on monthly closings. Um, so again, no audit. We didn't have to adjust your books. They were in good shape, and, and everything was uh, pretty much fully reconciled. We're issuing clean audit opinions on the financial statements, and those are um, pages one and two of the audit report. There was one new GASB statement this year. Um, I think they're up to about a hundred. Is it yeah, some about a little over 100 yeah, now? And, 99. <laughs> uh, this past year, you implemented uh, GASB Standard 84, which was fiduciary activities. And basically what that did is it moved your agent, agency fund out of the fiduciary funds and into a non-major special revenue fund. So they kind of redefined what agency funds were supposed to include, and they only want them to include monies that you've taken in and, and, and called custodial funds on behalf of another government. So basically they did away with agency funds and what was you recorded in there in previous years was your police and fire details and those amounts are now included in the non-major special revenue funds. So uh, just kind of move that around. That was the only new GASB statement that we were required to um, implement. And just quickly, the results for the year, your general fund ended with a balance of uh, a little over 3 million, 3, 3 million 016, and it decreased $129,000 for the year. And that decrease was planned. So anytime that you vote to use free cash to balance the budget, you're going to most likely end up with a, a negative uh, because that's basically what you plan to mm -hmm. do. So it, it was down $129,000 on about 19000 in revenue and expenses. So I would call that sort of a break-even year. So you voted to use 706,000 of, of free cash, and you really only ended up using 130. So again, that's not a lot of money on a on a 19 million dollar budget. And so I would look at that as sort of a break-even year. Um, the 3 million 16 that's in the general fund includes your two stabilization funds. There's a million 562 in the general stabilization fund. 344,000 in the capital stabilization, and again, these were numbers as of last June. So, if, if those numbers have changed since then, I'm, <laughs> I'm back in June still. Um, and this past year, you used $112,000 of free cash to balance your FY22 budget. Uh, so, on a budgetary basis, on page 69, there's a schedule in there that shows. You don't have to go to it if you want, but. There's a schedule in there that shows your um, your budgetary uh, basis of accounting. It's your budget compared to the actual results. And your revenue came in $1,200 over budget, pretty much right on the mark. And your expenses, including carryovers, were uh, $310,000 less than what you budgeted. So favorable budgetary results. Um, you didn't borrow any new money. Your long-term debt balances for governmental is $3.1 million, and your payments this past year were $265,000. The uh, water fund has 
$5 million of debt outstanding, and the payment for the past year was $205,000, and the sewer fund has $565,000 of long-term debt, and the payment on that was $45,000. Your um, pension liability at the end of the year was uh, uh, 9.124 million, and that was down about 351,000. You're a member of the Essex Regional Retirement System, so you really don't have any say over what happens with the retirement system. You, you pretty much have to rely on that board who makes the decisions on the discount rate and the investment rate of return and things like that. So you're in that system, and you, you get the report from them and record your numbers based on that report. Your OPEB balance at the end of the year was 5.4 million, down about 191,000 from the prior year. And for the activity in the fund, you contributed $205,000 above the pay-as-you-go requirement, and you had about $132,000 of investment income. So the fund went up um, by $337,000 for the year, and it, the ending balance was 853,000 now in the in the OPEB fund. So you're getting close to having a million dollars in there, and um, I know you're on budget to uh, put another contribution in for 22, and I don't know what you've got um, calculated going beyond that, but um, the valuation only showed up through 2022 being um, earmarked for uh, contributions. Um, so there's, there's not anything, there's no new footnotes this year. Um, basically, you know, all the numbers have been updated but there were no new required disclosures or anything like that. So the report is pretty much the same as it's been the last years. And I'll just kind of quickly flip through it. Our audit opinion is on pages one and two. And again, it's a clean audit opinion. Management's discussion and analysis follows that. And it's about six or seven pages. Again, you don't need to go to it right now either. It's six or seven pages of comparative information on the two years. It's the one place that you do see comparative information uh, basically, governmental financial statements are issued one year um, at a time. They're not comparative, but the MD&A is required to give you comparative numbers. So there's a comparative analysis on all the funds in here. And then it talks about um, your budgetary results and your capital asset and debt administration as well. And then the, the financial statements follow those for about nine or ten up more pages, and then the notes to the financials follow those. And again, there were no new notes there is required supplementary information that follow, follows the notes, and those are 10-year uh, tables that are being built for pensions and OPEB amounts. And um, then there's the required budgetary statement that I mentioned earlier. And then there's another audit opinion at the back, which is our um, opinion on your compliance with laws and um, regulations. And this is a, because we do the audit in, in under yellow book standards, this back page, these two pages, that's a required opinion as well. And again, it's, a, it's another clean opinion. We didn't have any, um, we didn't note any uh, violations of laws or regulations or any, anything that warranted us to make a comment in that report. So those are the financial statements. We also issued a management letter. The management letter has no new comments in it this year. And basically, we followed up and documented the five ongoing matters that have been going for the last few years. It's the number one is the bank reconciliations. Number two is tax title. And some progress has been made on uh, both the bank reconciliations and the tax title. I don't, I don't think you're going to see much more uh, change in the tax title um, until some of those properties flip over, actually, because I, I think you've, you've you, you lowered it by about $130,000 this past year, and I think that's about as much as you're going to get out of that until those properties flip. Um, there's a fraud risk assessment comment that um, um, hopefully is going to be worked on in FY22. There's an internal procedure manual comment that we've been talking about for a while, and again, I think that's on schedule to be started in FY22 as well. And then lastly, there's a um, documentation of internal controls following um, COSO standards, and this might not seem like a big deal, but it's if you have to do a, a single audit next year, it's a required that you have this COSO documentation or this COSO internal control framework documented. And we've provided a, a, a sample that you can use to um, 
build that and just change your names and, and some, of the, some of the procedures and things like that, and it'll satisfy. But without that, if you have to have a single audit because of the CARES or APRA money, then um, we'll have to write that up as a finding if, in the single audit report if you don't have that done by the end of FY22. Is there a threshold for the funding for the ARPA and the CARES, or is it just any federal no, it, funding? No, any spending, federal uh, award spending in any one year of over $750,000 requires you to have one. And it's not cumulative. It's just one, any one year that's over seven fifty, dollars you're required to have a single audit. Calendar or fiscal? Fiscal. Fiscal, yeah. So if you got a million dollars and you spent 500 one year and 500 another year, you would never need a single audit. Uh, so it doesn't look at the whole million dollars, it's, it's when it's spent. And as long as you don't go over 750 in any one year, um, you don't need one. And I don't think we've ever done one here. Um, we would go over this fiscal year. You, you possibly could, yeah, it depends. The ARPA funding and the purchase of the recent fire apparatus in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you go over the 750, you'll need one. And it, these um, these uh, COVID grants are very easy to audit. There's not a lot of moving pieces to them. You, 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 a lot of times you have permission to spend the money on how you spend it before you do. So they're really the audit risk on the uh, COVID related grants is pretty low. Uh, not, to, not to take anything away from them because they call them high risk grants. But the audit procedures to, to audit them are, are not complicated. So uh, pretty simple. So that's our, those are the two reports that we issued. I'd be glad to take any questions or. Anybody got questions them? for uh, Mike? Uh, Jason? No. Kathy? Um, go down the line. I'll be back. Uh, go. Yeah, you said they were close to some of these bank reconciliations that haven't been done since 2018? Oh, you know, two, there's are. two accounts. And yeah, it's it's on, we documented the amounts on page page three. So the, um, the vendor account is um, not completely reconciled to the tune of $326,000. And we believe that that was an accounting error made sometime over the last 10 years. I don't think the money is missing. I just think somebody put something in cash that really wasn't a receipt and um, it, it just hasn't been reconciled. It's coming close each each t each month when the reconciliation is done. It's like repeating the same amount over and um, management has, has taken the position that if, if, um, if once the account is reconciled and it's, it's duplicating the same information each year, then they're going to write the balance off. And um, the uh, online account was out of balance by $44,000. And that's consistent. Both of those numbers are consistent with what they've been in the past, for the most part. So they've been rolling this number for years and years and years and years. Yeah. And, and I, I just, you know, we've been looking at it, and I believe it's just a timing difference between some of the warrants. That, you know, because the light plant's on a different year end. They do their audit on 1231. You do yours on 630. Mm -hmm. There's never been a real good, clean cutoff of, of the reconciliations between the light plan and the, and the town, and and I I think that's where the variance popped up, um, but it, it, it's, it hasn't been identified specifically. But and at this point, you don't you don't believe the variance is real. It's 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 already been captured in years past. Yeah, yeah. I I just think there was an accounting entry made at some point in time that um, debited cash when it probably should have debited revenue or or warrants payable or something, and it just never got fixed. Um, and the online account is, is really a, that's just a process that needs to be um, verified and, and timing of that nailed down so that that variance gets captured too. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the cash goes, um, if it's a prior period, um, there should be a prior period adjustment. Um, could that be done and um, to clean up the books? And um, so we stop dragging it forward for another 10 years. Because yeah. I don't know that someone's going to resolve it um, if it's more than a few years. I don't, I don't think it's going to get resolved either. So I, I, and would, I don't think management Would the offset be to that. fund balance? And uh, is our, you know, there's an offset, right? Yep. So if we're overstated 300000 in cash, then our fund balance has to be off 300000 So as our balance sheet overstated, 
you know, the statement of uh, the yes, funds, fund is. balance. And could that be in the stabilization funds? Uh, no, I don't. Think that's it, real money that could impact our decisions. If it's if the three hundred thousand is, it doesn't exist. It is our almost two million in stabilization uh, inaccurate? The stabilization accounts are in in separate accounts. Yeah. Um, so those are not being they're not affected by this uh, variance at all. And the, and those are um, reconciled independently. Mm -hmm. Yes. So wh where would the three hundred thousand dollar offset be? Well, it's you're absolutely right. It's in your fund balance. It has so, to be an it, offset, and it, and it can be fixed through a beginning balance adjustment, so that it just changes the beginning balance of fund balance once you decide to write it off. Could that be done? Oh yeah, sure. So on on these financial statements, or on the next ones. Next ones. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Gather, you want to weigh in? Question. Um. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering, we had our budgeted um, taxes in the budget, the revenue in, and it showed that we didn't collect our budgeted taxes. Now, would that amount move into tax title then if we didn't collect it? Um, it just shows that it was like, you know, in parentheses, we didn't collect what I'm we... I'm not really sure I understand you, so the on first your, part of your question. On your, your, well, you told us our budget and our revenue sheet. I forgot yeah. which page that was on. Is it? Okay, thank you. Page 69. He's got this thing measure, memorized. Yeah, so um, we moved, you know, we collected 137. We lowered the um, the tax title by 137,000 roughly, but then we had 123 roughly, 123,000 of budgeted real estate taxes that we, it shows us that we didn't get them. Yeah, you will though. Those are sitting in receivables. Oh, okay. Those will be collected. So just, that's oh, hopefully they've come in <laughs> I by now. I got worried <laughs> that we weren't making progress. And my other thing is just getting back to that tax title amount. I know you and I have spoke about it before. We have this large property. Yep. Okay. That's sitting in there accruing interest, and it looks like we're not collecting this roughly 35% or more of that tax title is tied up with that valley screw. Is there any way we can separate that out just so that it's – the uh, tax title is a more realistic number for people to see because I know when people hear that we have, you know, five hundred thousand dollars plus of tax title, they think, "What are you, what's going on? Why aren't you collecting it?" But that Valley Screw Building plus some of these, like pieces of slivers of land that developers left behind and abandoned, and now the t the interest accrues on it. If you added that all up together. It's a pretty significant portion of that. We're never going to get that money. So what happens to it? Well, you'll get that money once the property, if the property ever flips, I assume, right? The valley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a federal, what is it, super fun cleanup site. Oh, it's a super fun, okay. Yes. All we're right. not allowed to touch the building. We can't go underneath to see if anything's wrong because if we find something wrong, we're liable for it. So we have this building that's collapsing in on itself. I get it, okay. On a property that is accruing interest and the... So that's the question that I'd like to get back to you on, okay? Okay, you thank can, you. There's, there's things that you can do, but I mean... There is? Okay. Um, I just think I'll it's just kind of... i just have to get a list of what they are, because <laughs> I don't want to say anything tonight on uh, <laughs> exactly but I'm just more interested, like, in when we research. show it reporting-wise, that we could, if we could report it separately, as a separate line at least, and just say, this is something that is going to take a lot of work, and this is what can be worked on and collected. Yeah, so, so let me get back to Rebecca on that one, and I'll, um, we'll, yeah. we'll come up with uh, what your options are for that. Right. Certainly you could separate it on okay. its own line, but right. whether or not there, there are other things that can be done with it, let me look into that, and I'll get okay. back to you. Bill, you had a question? Uh, no, just a statement. Could it be a simple footnote at the end of the financials? You know that uh, this amount uh, in tax title is, you know, based that. on... Uncollectibles like Valley Screw, yada yada yada. Yada yada. yada. <laughs> yes, you can. You can. These are your financial statements. You can do anything that you'd like to do, as long as it's not, um, you know, incorrect. But so as long as you can say whatever you'd like to say in here. So if you want to put it on a separate line and note it, or you want to put a footnote in the back and 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 describe what it is exactly, you could do that too. Um, so there's, there's things that we can do with it, and um, whatever you'd like to do, we can pretty much do. So I, I think what we're both trying to get at is a little bit more transparency sure. in what, what it really is and how much is realistically collectible at this point in time. 
so that you can differentiate between the two numbers and say, okay, we understand better now that the majority of this will never happen because of. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly we can do that. And just one last question. When you talked uh, about the investment and the investment risk, you, you seem to indicate that we're spread out appropriately on that. We have no more than it's like 5% in any. So that you feel that the funds in town are being invested in, you know, in a secure and uh, sure manner? I can't comment really on the security of the investments. They're diversified well, enough so that you don't have um, – they're not all in one basket where you, Correct, your yeah. risk is higher that way. Yes. So I can't comment as to the security of the investments themselves because anything can fail. Okay. Um, but you're diversified enough so that um, you, you're doing the right things with the investments. Okay. So if, yeah, if you, overall then that was a good report on that part of the Oh, time. yes. Yep. Okay. Good. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. We're required to to disclose if you have more than 5% of your investments in any one thing, and you don't have that. So okay. um, you're, you're okay with that. That's it. Uh, Mike, on that tax title property that you're talking about, what do we have, like 35%, 32% uh, of our uh, tax uh, taxes owed tied up to one piece of property? Uh, when you when you do the study, could, could you, uh, and, and I don't know if it's, if it's within your line to uh, uh, advise us on like a forced bankruptcy, mm -hmm. uh, can you take a look at that? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, anybody else got any questions? No. Uh, none. I think we're all set. Unless you got any questions for us. No. Nope. No. Nope. We asked all our questions during the audience. So. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> How about your security guard? Is she <laughs> Well, thank you very much for coming in. Okay. As always. Thanks for having us. Thank you. One last question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, how would you uh, rate the overall financial stability of the town today? I, I think you're doing well. So the three million dollars that you have in in the general fund is about 16 percent of uh, the general fund expenditures, and that's a number that the analysts look at. They hope they want that number to be somewhere between seven and 15. You're right at 15. You're a little over 15. I think you're at 15.8 or something like that percentage. So that's a good sign, and the stabilization numbers are are uh, good, and healthy uh, reserves to have. You're, you're funding your OPEB. That's another thing that the um, rating agencies look at. Um, the, the discount rate on the OPEB is 5%, um, which means that you've got a, a, a strategy for funding it. Otherwise, it'd probably be a little higher, and you. Um, your liability would be would be lower because of the higher discount rate, but um, yeah, I, I think everything is, is trending in, the, in a good direction for sure. So financially, we're doing everything we can to keep the town in the in the right direction. I, I think so. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for coming in. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Enjoy the rest of your night. Next uh, discussion: possible vote, global and precinct changes. Uh, on the town clerk, Beth, you're still here. Would you uh, would you like to uh, just uh, give us an explanation? Hi. <coughs> Months ago, you voted or you signed off on the precinct changes that the, were, are mandatory based on the 2020 federal census. And what I gave you tonight, well, what I have tonight is just a list of the streets that have been changed. And very few changes occurred for Groveland. We did not add an extra precinct. The only, oops, thank you. the only changes um, were minimal, and they are in El on Elm Park, numbers 5, 7, 13, 15, 19, 21, 23, 25, 27, 29, 35, and 39. On Main Street, it's number 306. On School Street, it's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 24, and 28. And on Spring Street, it's number 6. A letter has been sent to each of those residences. We put a, um, an informational piece out on the website so everybody knows. We still vote in one location, so it'll be just a minor change to walk in a different door and register on the other side for those residences. So that's just another way to get it out to people that they know that some areas were changed from Precinct 2 to Precinct 1. Okay. okay. Any questions for Town Clerk? No. None? Okay. Very good. And so we'll, we'll need to take a vote on this. 
No, you don't. No, there's no. It's know. it's already changed. Everybody's been notified. This was just like an informational. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. That was painless. Uh, next on the agenda, vote to approve the Pines Recreation Area practice field used for Pentucket Youth Football, August 2022 to November 2022. Anybody here to speak on that? Yes. Scott? Yes. How are you? Wonderful. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I represent the Pentucket Youth Football League Board. Uh, I am the Groveland Ambassador for the board. Um, they decided this year to kind of give each town a person to represent that particular town. I am a Groveland resident for 10 years, so I represent Groveland. Um, with the high school not being ready yet for us to practice, the last two years we've used the Lower Pines field. Uh, we wanted to go ahead and use that again starting in August. I think August 15th is the exact date. I didn't have it when I submitted the paperwork to you. Uh, and I think we end um, November 18th. It's a Friday. It should be our last day uh, down there. It'll be similar to the last year. The three teams, A, B, and the C team will be down there. Uh, we'll have um, rental of lights as we have in the years past, obviously because there's no, no lights to facilitate the practices running late, especially as we get into the uh, later months. Um, so if you, I don't know if anybody has any questions for me, but that's basically about it. They're going to be used just for practice, or they have the games there? Just practice. Just practice. Just practice. We are going to be, all three teams will be travel teams this year. With no high school being available at this time, uh, we've inquired with Georgetown uh, if we could use their football fields, and the answer today was a resounding no. So uh, we will be a 10-game travel, no, no home games, three years in a row now. So the boys are, I think, they're really looking forward to having a, uh, a home field soon uh, as we move forward. Um, so they're, you know, we can run our booster programs through there and, and that type of thing. So, um, so hopefully, hopefully next year. That's what we're hoping for. And it looks like you uh, uh, supplied the application. Uh, anybody got any questions for Scott? Bill? Um, yeah, you've been using that field a lot longer than the last three years. Yeah. I, Even I, when I, the high school field was there, you were still using that field because it's the best field you have. It's the best field in the district. There's no doubt about it. Um, the only comment I have is I was on that board for a few years, had three kids play through it. Um, so the only thing I ever wanted was to make sure we have a certificate of insurance that names the town as one of the insured in case anything happens. Um, the utility field basically is free mm -hmm. um, during that time. So I don't know in the last 10 years if you any, but we've ever run into a conflict down there. I don't so you shouldn't. Yeah. I know lacrosse has asked for it in the spring, only till pipe stave gets a little drier. Uh, but they don't uh, impact you. I think they just requested for um, like next week for a couple of weeks until pipe stave drives, and then you're all set. Um, the um, containers. Yes. We had. What are we going to try to do with those containers to get them off the grass? Is there, was there a better location? I know you and I had talked about that at one time. We had talked about potentially maybe relocating them on the, the concrete and taking up a parking space of some sort. We didn't necessarily have a better location per se. We were just hoping to get them off the grass so that we could irrigate that particular area and not um, potentially kill the grass. Yeah, I, I'm sure you've noticed that the utility field where you use is in much better shape than the field coming this way now. Absolutely. We're actually trying to develop a plan to make those fields now look as good as that utility field um, by bringing some better irrigation and, and you know doing similar things that we did down in that utility field. So I'm not sure how, how much of a pain in the neck is it to move if you had to move it. I know, I know we... You keep all your equipment in there. You keep your uniforms, the pads, the helmets. Yeah, everything's in there. Everything's yeah. in there. Yeah. So it's a pain. Yeah. But, I mean, if we needed to move them, I'm sure we could get that done. Especially if you could, you know, carve out a zone, like you said, that further parking lot down by where the dog area is maybe or something. I don't know. Well. If we needed to, we could. Funny you should mention that because that's going to work out well for you because we're getting a new dog park, which is going to be located more up toward the entrance 
So that part will be um, much more uh, available mm -hmm. to put them, something like that there on the, on the gravel road, right? So that's not too far down the road. No. Okay. Okay, anybody else got anything? Um, Kathy? Just an informational question. So you use the um, Pinesfords for the Tri-Towns, right? The Pentac correct. And, but it's only up through eighth grade or? Uh, yes, correct. Okay. And you're anticipating that when the new high school and middle school opens, they're going to give you field space there? That's what we're hearing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and this was literally in our last meeting, which was like two weeks ago. So. Okay, so that's what you're yes. hearing. Okay. You'll get games. Hearing. You won't get practice time there, I'm telling you. That's, they want to have it there, but will they? You'll get games there, yeah. no doubt. But I doubt you'll get practice time. So. But we still have a home for you here, and you're always welcome. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Dan? Nothing? Jason? Nope. Mm -hmm. You can't use utilize that for, for the games? We could. Um, I don't know if that's ever really been fully vetted. Uh, we've the, the board had a full turnover this year. So it's all new people, basically, except for two. Um, and uh, that actually was brought up at one point when we were hoping to use Georgetown with the established field and all that. That's where we thought we were really were to end up. But literally today, I got the email about 12 o'clock today saying no. So we could potentially use that spot, but I guess I'd have to come back to you and talk about it and get it back on a, a vote. So. Okay. I'll bring it up in our next meeting, which is next week. So uh, We're going to need a, a motion to uh, uh, approve the Pines Recreation Area a practice field for use by the Pentucket, Pentucket Youth Football in uh, October 2022 to November 2022. Any motion, somebody? I'll move that uh, contingent upon them providing the town with a certificate of insurance, naming the town as one of the insured. Is there a second? I'll second it. And a second. Any further discussion? No. Go ahead. What do you What do you do with the younger kids? Did, did we did, did we used to play um, uh, A B C D and and we had an E team one year. Yeah, not anymore. There's no E T anymore. It's, really? It's just A B and C this year. That's just it. Just A B and C. That's it. So eighth, seventh, and sixth grade. It's no eight, more fourth and fifth. Eight, seven. Oh, I'm sorry, you're correct. Yeah, eight, it's eighth grade A, fifth and sixth, and then fourth. Yes, they're down here on the in front of the little shed. Okay. So they've been playing in front of the, practicing in front of the shed, and then the two bigger teams practice on the bigger fields. So. Okay, motion. Uh, you, was, is, you, you second it? We got seconded. Yes. Oh, Dan, Dan seconded. seconded. Dan. Uh, any further discussion? Not all in favor? Aye. Right. Unanimous. Thank you for Thank coming you. in. Have a good season. Thanks. Thanks. Good luck. Uh, Next, we have vote to uh, approve Common Vic license transfer for uh, Riverside Pizza LLC, 180 Main Street. Peter Oresco. Yes. And you, you, Peter? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm in the process of buying Riverside Pizza. Um, keep it a pizza place, sub place. And. And you need a, a, a transfer of the Common Vic license. When when are you going to take effect? Uh, uh, hoping around mid-April. Still in the uh, process. I'm sorry, May. Mid-April. Middle mid-April. Yeah, still finalizing details. Okay, and you've supplied a uh, uh, copy of the insurance policy. Yes, all that has been submitted. Excuse me. Yes, all of that has been submitted. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, we want to make a motion to. Uh, Approve the Common Vic license transfer. I'll make a motion to approve the Common Vic license transfer. And it's going to be Pete. Is that what you're going to call it, or is it still going to be Riverside Pizza? I wouldn't keep it Riverside. Okay. Um, just Pizza is so the LLC. It's for the Riverside Pizza. Yeah. And Pete's. Pizza. Pizza is. <laughs> yeah, you have to say it a lot. Is the is the owner of record, and we have the insurance and everything. All the documents are seem to be here. Yep. So uh, I moved it. I'll second it. Uh, motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Dan, uh, uh, go ahead, Justin. Jason. Yeah. Um, is it a transfer? I mean, I thought they're just getting a common vic, so it's not really a transfer. It's just applying for a new common vic. Yes, oh. it is. Yep. Okay. I stand amended then. then. Yeah, so comment. Thank just you. To strike transfer. Good. Thank you. 
Yep, everything there looks to be in order. Okay, any further discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Welcome Thank to Groveland. Thank, Thank you for coming Thank you. up. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. We'll get some pizza. Uh, <laughs> ARPA uh, additional request for a premium pay per request for the Highway Union and Water and Sewer Union. Hello. My name is Matt Silva. I work for the Water and Sewer Department. Uh, thanks, you, thanks to everyone here for coming and considering the premium pay for us and the ARPA fund. Uh, but first of all, we must separate ourselves from the Highway Department. Uh, they do tremendous work for the town and they save the taxpayers money each year. But our duties, funding and licensing are inherently different. Uh, we are actual frontline workers responsible for public health and we must adhere to all regulations under the Clean Water Act like we heard about earlier. And we're held accountable through the town, state and federal government. Uh, we deal with a physical product that's consumed into the body and then we must safely deal with the waste product afterwards. Uh, we're enterprise not tax based so we have to maintain the meters, valves and things like that inside of private homes and businesses throughout the town to continue funding our department. We must all pass multiple tests to even work in the field as competent operators and we must understand some advanced science and math in order to even function in our job. Um, so on that end, sewer and sanitary water plants are responsible for the extreme downturn of waterborne illnesses in the last 100 to 150 years and we handle the production and distribution of water and all aspects of maintaining such infrastructures including going in and out of businesses, schools and homes. Um, after the residents or businesses use the said water, our department handles and effectively facilitates the dangerous wastewater. Um, we take, so during COVID too, we take monthly samples five consecutive days each month, which includes actually coming in direct contact with wastewater. Uh, wastewater, is, as you might know, is, or even fine mist of wastewater can be saturated with feces, blood, urine, spit, medication, other pharmaceuticals or illicit drugs among many other things that people flush down their toilets. We did not halt our maintenance or production throughout the pandemic. We were in every day. Um, the frontline exposure we mostly dealt with was clogged sewer pumps. In town, we have six sewer pump lift stations. And from March 2020 to September 2020, we were physically manually removing Clorox wipes from each pump. I have pictures here. I don't know if you want to see them. actually have a video here of us physically removing the Clorox wipes from the pumps. Yeah, yeah it was it was fun. <laughs> so we um, we were frontline workers for sure. I don't know if you can keep going. I saw it on the town crier. Yeah, this is where it's from. And, and honestly, there's more pictures that I, I have too, you know, coming in direct contact with wood sewer. <coughs> um, so people, people put those down the drain. Yeah, it says on the container flushable, and that's true, it will flush, but they all collect in the sewer lift stations, and those pumps just, once one or two of those gets tangled, I don't know if you tried to pull them out of the container, but they get stuck sometimes, just, it's, yeah. they're so tough to get out. Um, but yeah, so during all that time, uh, there was no vaccine, there was no treatment available to the public, the only guidance was to stay home and slow the spread. And the science was always understood that COVID was in the wastewater. Coronavirus has been studied for years. It's not a new thing. And other health, hazard, oh, excuse me, other health hazards in the wastewater that we were touching. We had PPE, but still. <laughs> um, there's actually a clear 14 day parallel correlation between wastewater influx and a surge of positive tests and sicknesses. And I don't know if anyone's interested. I have a Yale study here. Um, the Yale School of Public Health um, actually is September, 2020. They have some really nice charts and stuff. I have some Google links that you can, if you guys want to see them, I don't know, I'll just put them here. I'll pass it around. Just some interesting things about the wastewater. Uh, they accurately predict the increase of positive uh, sicknesses with the wastewater. Um, so for us as a department, our skeleton crew lasted about four weeks, but each week we were coming in and pulling those pumps like we showed you. So we did technically have a skeleton crew for about four weeks, but we were working. <laughs> um, yeah, multiple times a week. And then we started flushing hydrants, reading water meters, uh, performing backflow tests. Like I was going in Chesterton, all the schools, all the buildings on Federal Way, um, you know, coming in contact with people, construction, Billis Way, Atwood, all these all these houses they're building, 
you know, we're coming around crews, not just one or two people. Um, and then, you know, going home to our families and yeah, so we're, uh, that's really the, uh, the point I want to drive home is we're all going home to our families after coming in contact with all this stuff. Um, when, you know, it's a worldwide pandemic and that's why I believe that we qualify for the premium pay. Um, yeah, we have documents of our work schedule throughout the pandemic. If you guys want to see those showing us at work full time when town hall remained closed or working remotely well past August 2021. Um, the sewer issues we face during this declared state of emergency are enough reason for our operators to receive the premium pay. The governor declared a state of emergency March 10th, 2020. It lasted until June 5th, 2021. Um, again, I'd like to separate us from the highway. We're, I think the last meeting we asked for 10,000. We don't want 10,000. We want six as a department. So if the highway wants to argue their case for this, that's not on us to do. So I'm just asking for the 6,002 for each of us. And uh, thank you for your time, and I hope you consider it. Thank you. Uh, anybody got any questions? questions? I want you to stay up there in case somebody got any questions. Sure. Yeah. Jason? I don't have any uh, questions. I would like to make a statement. That was an excellent proposal. Thank you. Very well spoken. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Kathy, got anything? No, I was just getting some yeah, shots in this research. Just um, I was interested in it. You know, what you had said, it made me wonder if, they, if that could be the case. So, interestingly, the CDC says um, the virus that causes COVID has been found in untreated wastewater. To your point, researchers do not know whether the virus can cause disease if a person is exposed to untreated wastewater or sewage systems. There is no evidence to date that this has occurred. At this time, the risk of transmission of the virus that causes COVID through properly designed and maintained sewer systems is thought to be low. Um, so, I guess just to your point, it is found. Studies have shown it. That's how they, they kind of know where the level is in certain communities. Yep, the correlation was what I was getting yeah. at. You know, you can see. Um, the there's definitely correlation between the, you know, what they find in the, in the wastewater to the number of sick people or hospitalizations and everything. Yep. But according to the CDC, as to date, there's no correlation between being exposed to that. Um, is, uh, <laughs> there's no evidence that um, the transmission occurs, unlike person-to-person -person contact. Which we also did a lot of. <laughs> so that's just one layer to the onion, you know? Uh, yep. <laughs> but I guess I'm trying to separate what you folks do from what, the, what we consider first responders mm -hmm. that 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 human to human contact that's where the transmission okay. is at a much much greater rate yep. Just so uh back backflow device testing we have to go in and meet with maintenance personnel or whoever say chesterton i personally do chesterton there's got to be a hundred workers that i walk past you know and that's twice a year and throughout the pandemic that's just another i, I don't know if you were doing that at chesterton during the pandemic because i know most most of them were, were working remotely. Yeah, the office workers were. Yep, the offices were, uh, you know, Empty. ghost town. Yeah, it was crazy. Yep, I know they're all in my living room. But the machines got to keep running. They're still making packing. They're still making all their things. And I'm walking through and close contact for sure. And that, you know, coming in homes and things. Um, even just a few months ago, some lady didn't want us coming into her home. And she has a meter <clears throat> that we can't read. Her valve's broken. She doesn't want us coming in the home. But we are, we're enterprise, we need to make money too, so we're kind of at a standstill with stuff like that. But we're definitely going in homes, businesses, schools, all that. Aside from the sewer, pulling Clorox wipes out of the pumps was fun. <laughs> yep. Dan, you got anything? I think pulling those uh, nasty wipes out of those pumps is worth the money alone. I mean, that's a, <laughs> Thank you, know, you. I appreciate you saying that. Used like, to be a used to be a show on the cable there, you know, dirty jobs with uh, Mike Rowe. Kind of yeah, Mike Rowe. Yeah, that might be a great candidate for that. Maybe, but uh, resurrect the show, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, did you do that before the pandemic? Pull all those wipes out of there. Um, so it did happen occasionally. Um, you know, maybe once every six months we would pull one. Um, from that, I think that video was from April 2020 until September. It was probably like two times a week, three times a week, consistently. Uh, yeah. And um, 
If there's COVID in the untreated water, we could probably catch it from it. There might not be evidence of it. Thank you. Yes. Don't and I argue over these things, but there's the no mystery. evidence there's life on other planets because so that's because the human race isn't smart enough to find it yet. But that doesn't mean it might not exist. So just because technology hasn't kept up with reality, it's kind of not your fault. Thank you. Yes. So I'm with you. Cool. And like, yeah, you open up the the lift station. There's mist. Yeah, if you're knows. looking at it, if it looks like COVID, it smells like COVID. It is COVID. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, re re refresh your memory. At, at what point during the pandemic did you did you guys go to uh, uh, two day uh, two days? I believe we have a schedule of it. Um, it was only four weeks that I can recall. If you went, you went uh, uh, like somebody worked. Uh, two guys worked Monday and Tuesday. Uh, two guys worked. Uh, it was just the man on call. Thing? Just the man on call did the week, and then. But again, you know, we had to, we have to put in data numbers and we have to pull in pumps, and so we were in. You know, there's and, and I know it's got to be checked on on the weekends and yep. uh, and, and the days off. But I I, I thought uh, you guys did the same schedule the highway, uh, uh, two days that you were working, and uh, and then if the other the two guys that were off, if if you needed assistance, then then they would come in. Yeah, again, we did that four weeks, I think, maybe five. I don't think it was five. I think it was four weeks because we have three men, so only one person did a double on-call rotation. So that's four weeks. But, um, no, yeah, we and we did Friday skeleton crew, so we'd work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, take Friday off for a couple months. I'm not sure how many months, but even then we were flushing hydrants and, and still pulling pumps until about September. And Yeah, you know. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, um, how do we want to deal with this? Uh, any suggestions? Uh, I think we should talk about it on the next uh, item because uh, we're going to be talking about the overall Amer American okay. Rescue Plan Act. All right, so we'll go to uh, the, AA, uh, the, the ARPA uh, selected uh, project review. Jason, you want to start that off? I'm looking for it. Not right? particularly, but <laughs> I will. Um, I know that uh, this has become a very hot topic because of the, the premium pay. And um, when we did the police and the fire, there was a lot of talk and concern about leaving somebody out. And I think effectively we did that when we left everybody out. Here at Town Hall, the Water Department, the Highway Department. So I think we should really reconsider and, and uh, include everybody in that based on the schedule that you put together for the fire and the police department. In terms of where that money would come from, I think it would come from the proposed Wood Street or Belt Street water replacement, especially because I would like to visit bulk with doing mm -hmm. the water and sewer since it would be running right down to uh, Main Street at the same time. I don't know if Colin will want to speak on that now and give me some advice to uh, my comments bad, good, or indifferent. Um, I mean, Colin, can you go up to the uh, podium? I can't find the list. Colin Stokes, water and sewer superintendent. Um, ultimately, that would be a great idea. Um, but as of the last meeting, uh, it was brought to question whether or not we should have to raise the money with our rates because we have the ability to do so. Um, so every project that we have to do, we have to raise the money somehow, right? So if we're not going to get any money from ARPA then and we want to run water and sewer up Ball Jav, we're going to have to raise the rates to do so um, and or hit everyone on Ball Jav with some type of betterment. Uh, typically, that's how we do sewer projects. We take the total cost of the job, divide it by how many houses are going to be benefited by it, and that's the cost per household. Um, that's why this ARPA funding is great, because it allows us to do infrastructure work without hitting the people in the pocket. Um, yeah, I know that, um, in terms of for myself, because there's so little sewer in Groveland, mm -hmm. I think it would be more beneficial to, to Groveland to do it as a rate versus the individual houses. Because I know when I spoke to the people on Cranton Ave, that's how it was proposed to them. And it was like 
twenty or thirty thousand dollars per household, mm -hmm. and it's just not feasible. Which means we're not going to be able to advance the uh, sewer because of that for each of those households. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a more broad thing that Groveland really needs to get behind and support. One to help clean up the the ground and make sure that our water groundwater is always clean. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something I, th I think I would like to focus on. And, uh, and I think that would definitely be a good way of doing it and providing the premium pay uh, to all the employees, including the ones here at Town Hall. Yeah, I think the, um, I mean, Balch Ave, I don't know if, I'm sure if most of you have driven up it recently. It's horrendous. <laughs> um, that's why Balch Ave was one of the streets that I proposed because in doing the water main, you would also get the road paved as part of that. Um, so it was kind of killing two birds with one stone. So we'd get a new water main. That water main is from 1920s. It's a four, I believe it's a four inch. And when we flush that line, we can't even flush out all the uh, minerals that are in it because we can't get enough flow through the pipe. So it's severely choked down. Uh, so we'd get a new water main and you get a new road arguably for free and the, the, well, the good part about it is we wouldn't use even a, a substantial portion of that I don't believe for uh, premium pay so you would still have a, a pretty good chunk of that yeah that's that would be my proposal okay anybody else Kathy um yes this a number, there's a couple of items that I've been giving some thought to for the um, ARPA money. And so my concern is that it's not an unlimited fund. It's going fast. Right. So we've set aside an amount of money to study the issue of the lead in the water at the Bagnell School. Mm -hmm. But a study doesn't fix it. Right. So what I wanted to do was to take away the water and sewer project oh, of course. money. I mean, <laughs> everyone saw that coming. <laughs> and the sidewalk project money. And the sidewalk project money waiting to see the results of this Bagnell study because this is the water that the children need to drink and we do not have the funds to fix this problem anywhere else. Absolutely. And um, to me that's one of the highest priorities in addition to the asbestos removal that needs to be completed because we just don't have this money. Our budget, well you've already seen with the school override and the budget is as tight as it's ever going to get. and. This ARPA money is our one opportunity to make that school as safe as possible. So I wanted to see that done. And for the town employees, I wanted to take a portion of the ARPA money and do a proper salary survey, union and non-union, to see where we line up so that we can start making steps to make sure that we're competitive um, in this job market. Everybody comes up every year with their own salary studies. Some people get the money, some people don't get the money. We have no system, we have no study that really says independently, mm -hmm. where are we? And this is, again, this one-time money would give us the opportunity to take care of this overriding salary issue across the boards for all of our town employees. So in, in some ways, I think that benefits them a lot more than premium pay because this would be an ongoing salary adjustment, which we just can't make individually. Right. Yeah, so I mean, that's I can, kind of where I'm coming from right now. I look at this amount of money that seemed to be so big. At first, I was like, "This is a lot of money," and it's already so small. Right. And we need to prioritize here because once it's gone, this is our one chance to do the highest priority things we can do in our town for our residents, you know, and for the children at Bagnell. Yeah, I I can completely understand that thank you um, what I would ask if, if we're not going to propose um, spending any of it on any infrastructure work is maybe a little bit of support when we do go to raise the water and sewer rates to do projects <laughs> all right I won't, there is I won't complain zero support. this one time <laughs> um, so I, and I'm you know I live here as all of you do yeah. no one wants to pay more money but yeah Everyone wants to compl complain about the infrastructure that we have, and the only way to fix it is to spend money on it. Um, I understand. And we have a very small pool of people that, that pay into both of those things. Right. We have about 1,900 water customers and about 700 and some odd sewer customers. Right. 
So all that cost gets thrown at those people. Um, so again, everyone wants to complain about it, but no one wants to do anything to fix it. Um, yeah. We have two open spots on the water and sewer board, and no no one pulled papers. Nobody pulled any papers. So at all. it's going to be increasingly right. more difficult to to do anything. <laughs> um, but you know, if we don't, if we want to spend money on the on the bag now for the lead, you know, okay, my son goes there. That's great. <laughs> Yeah. But um, some universal support for yep. the money that's needed has to come from somewhere. So right. people's water rates will go up if we have to do it otherwise. But I understand that part. <laughs> I'm, I'm not nope. envious of your uh, position to have to decide what to spend all this money on. I'm, and I understand in the, in the grand scheme of things, $2 million, not a lot of money. They didn't go that far. Yeah. No. Even if you gave me all of it, I couldn't do. <laughs> I couldn't even touch the amount of work that I need to do. Right. Um, but. But it still is, you know, for our town, it's a one-time allocation, and I just want to make sure that we look at all the priorities in the town. So, I'm not trying to dismiss your presentation tonight or your, you know, presentation on water. It's just I feel that we've overlooked um, the Bagnell School because all we set aside was money for the study. Mm -hmm no good the study's no good if we have no money to fix anything oh i'm sure it's going to be expensive to repipe that whole school mm -hmm. for sure <laughs> yeah and that's you think that's where that's going to go i couldn't fathom a guess of what it's going to cost i have but no idea yeah whatever you think it's going to be double it that's probably what it'll be i don't even think <laughs> so, I have no idea. <laughs> pull a number out of thin air double it you might be close well my concern is just that this is the only time we're going to have this kind right. of funding yeah. available it's and, uh, uh it falls into the same category, though, of, you know, the can's been consistently kicked down the road with a lot of things, um, like right. the high school, you know, never got properly maintained and fell apart, and now we're building a new one. Right. But well, that's why I think a salary survey may sound like a frivolous thing, but if it's done properly, it sets, it sets columns for union and yeah. non-union, and it gives us an idea of where we stand you know, in comparison to other comparable communities and also will help guide us towards making sure that we're paying fair money to people and trying to keep um, talented workers here. Yeah. I think you'd have yeah. a hard, hard time getting someone to say that we shouldn't fix the uh, lead stuff in the school. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. That one is kind of a high priority. Yeah. <laughs> that's coming from, you know, all the solder and all the fixtures that are in the school. The, the, the brass has lead in it, so it's not going away. It's there. Right. So. And so now they've shut down the water fountains, right? Isn't that what they uh, did? I believe so, yeah, a few years okay. ago. Mm -hmm. They replaced right. a couple of them, if, if I am yeah. told correctly. Yeah. Um, but... The solder that they use in, in, in the old solder had lead in it. The fittings okay. and the pipes have lead in it. Um, the faucet itself has lead in it. So, great. The new stuff doesn't have that, but okay. When that school was built, that was the technology available, and that's what we have. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bill. Do you have anything, Colin? Um. No, I didn't. You know. How many 1961 F-150s you see driving down the street? Exactly. And it's not because... 61 would be a good vintage compared to some of the stuff we have. And it's not because someone didn't take care of it. It's because things wear out. Right. Things break down. Things become more costly to repair than to replace. Right? Yeah. That's why you have a new school, not because nobody didn't take care of well, it. Well, so I misspoke on that. But at, at a certain point... For preventative maintenance going forward is better than not doing anything, and, and then you have to invest yeah. a whole lot of money all at once. And even that only takes you so far. Correct. Yeah. Because we live in a world where things are built to fail. Yeah. If anybody sold a product that lasted forever, yeah. you'd be out of business in short order because cool. you'd only sell one. Right. There'd be no repeat customers. So built-in obsolescence is part of the life we live with. Yeah. It sucks, but it, it does, is yeah. what it is. 
got to spend a bunch, spend, you know, to fix things and replace things cost money. And yep. if you're not on staying on top of it and, and re- it, doing a little bit at a time and pay me now, we'll pay me later. Right. The old frame commercial. Yep. We're, we're yep. now at the point of pay me a lot to do anything <laughs> because of the, the, uh, the cost of, of goods. Mm-hmm. Even if I wanted to buy a water pipe right now, I'm, I'm told 26 weeks just to get a piece of pipe. Yep. And it'll be, you know, 52 before you can hire somebody to put in the piece of yeah. pipe because there's not a lot of labor out there right now. Yeah. It's not a good situation, but we, uh, we can't just not do anything. So. No, nope. I know. Okay, Dan, you got anything for Colin? Yeah, I just um, I think we have to wait and see on the uh, bag now and if there's money left over. Yeah. Um, then I'd support, you know, infrastructure changes, you know. Is it just uh, water lines or, or sewer too? Um, so the two projects that I had given you would basically cost the same amount. It's the same linear amount of pipe. Um, did not include sewer. Did not. Um, in the grand scheme of things, if you were if we were going to do Balch Ave, yeah. and we wanted to ask the residents if they wanted sewer, you know, it would cost more money and. Would that be a special assessment in, in all cases to add sewer? Because, I mean... Typically, that's how the, the Water and Sewer Board has done it. Um, otherwise, you're charging people who have already paid. You're charging them more for someone else to get sewer service. And I don't know how this town's done it, but in other municipalities, there have been some sort of financing arrangement on that? Or when you sell the house, you pay? or if the, Yeah, so basically it goes as a lien against the pro- property, yep. and it gets paid... You know, a little bit at a time over, a, I don't know, 20 years or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then if you sell the house, you pay off the lien to, to the, the sewer department. Yeah. Because we're perpetually paying off that loan. Septic's no 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 uh, no uh, no piece of cake either, you know. 30, yeah. 40 grand for a septic system, so. Uh, yeah, typically more. the more houses you can get involved in a process, the cheaper it gets. Um, just spreading out the cost. A high density area would be have a lower cost. Um, you know, if you were to run sewer out Seven Star Road, not as many houses, so it would cost more per household. Um, what if you just did the rest of the town all at once and got a bond? <clears throat> That's arguably what should have happened in the 60s when they started it. But yeah, you know, I, I wasn't born until yeah, me either. 66, <laughs> so I, I couldn't help them back then. But, I mean, that's has anyone ever looked at that, get a you know, 20 or 30-year bond and just do everything? Because we have an aquifer in town, and everybody wants to protect it. Um, we bought up land to protect it. We've done all kinds of things to protect it, and yet we still have septic systems with uh, leach fields and mm-hmm. bleach and washer and dryer and the garbage disposal, all kinds of stuff going out into the drinking water. It goes out in the water table, and it filtrates into the the aquifer. And... Uh, and uh, I don't know if anyone can uh, figure out where the barriers are, but, uh, you know, we're all drinking what we dump, yep. whether it's the Merrimack River and the prior conversations. You know, the politicians don't like to talk about it, you know. It's kind of pooping where you drink and eat. Mm. But uh, is there any way to look at an overall price and try to get a long-term bond on it to uh, get, get terms? I'm sure there is. Uh, I don't think anything of that grand of a scheme has been thought of here in a long time Um, we do have sewer master plans that show sewering the whole town Uh, that's how it was proposed originally when they brought sewer here Uh, it was late 60s i think Um, i think the cost would be astronomical Um, but it's never going to get cheap no it i mean if you do it piecemeal is it any more cost effective no probably not but you know, like I, it's never been looked at that I'm aware of. Oh, we got Certainly a, not in the we, last two and a half years that I've we been. We got a new town planner. Maybe that's a project. Yeah, I mean, anyth- anything's possible. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, just a uh, word on that. I mean, I think it's a great idea because the more people you get into the into the system, uh, the cheaper the cost would be. Well, what's the uh, uh, what's the uh, treatment plan running at capacity now? Any idea? Um, how much more can they take? I don't know how much they, so they're, we're, we're under contract with them. So they have to take a certain amount from us and we, on average, 
pump about a quarter of what we're allowed to send them. Um, so they're adding all the time. So they must be uh, they must be near uh, a high percentage, eighty plus ninety percent capacity. Yeah, I'm not sure of what. Uh, I know when it if it rains a lot, they get overflows, but that's not from. So it's from all their street drains are tied into their sewer over there, so that's why it it does what it does. But but it. Uh, 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 Balch Avenue seems like a, a no-brainer to, to run uh, sewerage down there. Yeah, so the top part of Balch already has sewer. It goes down, it dumps into uh, Governor's Road and comes out, but the lower part of Balch does not have sewer. Um, would you need a lift station? Would you have to push it up the hill? No, so it could, it could come down gravity into Main Street. Um, it was just never, hasn't been done. No, no, and that uh, that's like a minefield going up that street. Yeah. Uh, uh, it seemed, seemed to me, if, if you're going to do water, you do sewage at the same time. Get a, get a cost on that. Yeah, we can look into that. It seems. All right, anybody else? Uh, well, we, we'll, I think we're going to see what uh, the bagnell is, and then we'll see what we got left. Okay. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, uh, oh, there you are. Uh, thank you. Uh, nice job. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. So the other uh, two items on that particular excuse me there's two other items that um i wanted to bring up oh yeah sure go ahead that particular item so for the two selected projects we had talked about potentially looking at placing the uh, police cruiser that we typically put forward on our uh, warrant for a free cash article bringing up some of our free cash instead of um, allocating it towards that particular uh, expense item and then the other as Kathy had mentioned is the wage classification study and we were going to put forward a warrant article utilizing free cash again to pay for that um, since we had made a promise to the employees to move forward in that fashion so both the fifty one thousand seven hundred dollars and the thirty thousand dollars that would be coming from free cash and in opposed to that we're proposing that it come from the American Rescue Plan Act funding. What were the uh, what were the two breakdowns again? How much in each? Fifty one thousand seven hundred for the police cruiser and thirty thousand dollars for the wage classification study. And right now again those are proposed as free cash articles for the annual town meeting warrant as they would typically be um, in prior fiscal years. I, I thought we were going to jump on the study that Merrimack had, had done, that most of their, their groundwork had already been completed on that. So this would technically jump on board with the Merrimack and the West Newberry uh, wage classification study, but it would be more directed towards Groveland and the actual positions that we have. A lot of our employees here don't just do one specific task. They wear a bunch of different hats. So this would focus on exactly what their responsibilities um, are and what they're required to do and take a broader look at that specifically rather than just comparing wages across different communities. Okay. Um, and, uh, anybody got any uh, comments on that? I do. Using 51.7 for yeah. police cruiser and uh, 30,000 for the wage study? Um, I think it makes good financial sense this year um, because of how tight our budget is. And I think that um, the wage classification study will save us um, a lot of a lot of money in the long run because it will, if it's specific to our jobs in Groveland, it will identify what people, how many different um, tasks people are doing, and it will value what they're contributing to this town so that we don't keep losing people to the next higher bidder. I think this will be a good start to retaining our workforce and making them understand that we intend to value them. And I think taking it from free cash will protect us in a really tight time. We don't, we don't have very much in free cash right now anyway. No, again, and that's really what the strategy is behind this, is that the, bu the budget as proposed is extremely tight. And because it's tight, um, the ability to have as much free cash and stabilization as we can to plug any holes come this time next fiscal year. Um, budget line items have been reduced in order to accommodate 
um, the budget cuts that we needed to have with the amount of revenue that we had taken in or we predict to take in the next fiscal year. So if those line items get overspent, you know, it's not going to be like typical uh, like this year currently where, you know, we've had turnover and we can do some, you know, last end of year transfers um, and we don't have to worry about going to town meeting and making those transfers. Next year will be a completely different story. Uh, once we get to those line items, there's not going to be anything to take that from. Um, so giving us the ability to have that additional free cash and not spend it will allow us to have that flexibility if we need to, depending on how things shape up over the next fiscal year. Well, you know, I, I uh, but I, I disagree, Kathy, with you that the, uh, uh, I think the wage study is a great idea. Yeah. I don't see it saving us money. I think it's going to uh, tell us that uh, uh, a lot of our employees are underpaid. And so I think it's going to, in the long run, it's going to, uh, going to cost us more money. Well, but I, I think it's a great idea to find out. If uh, I, I just want to uh, clarify. Well, do, you, do you want to let me finish or do you want, go no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. You're going to interrupt anyway. Go no, ahead. No, because you said that. Go ahead that what I said wouldn't save us money. I just wanted to explain that what I meant by that is we won't keep losing employees and having to go out to bid again to keep people. That's how we lose money. So go ahead, they'll finish your statement. Okay, uh, anybody else? I, I thought that we had the opportunity for a, to partake in a compensation study a year ago or whatever. Then. Are we talking about? Yes. So we don't need these funds for that. Huh? Well, it didn't. Uh, it was there was a uh, the last doing that or something. What, excuse me. Wasn't it DOI or something? Uh, Somebody from the state. Yeah, I think so. Uh, wasn't there uh, something new? Uh, uh, didn't we get a grant for a study on on that? We were um, trying to apply for a grant, but we had run into a situation where there was a couple of grants that uh, we had received um, a couple years back that weren't completed, and until we are able to complete those items, we're at a standstill for applying for any additional grants throughout that program. Uh, we are trying to finish those up as we speak, um, but whether or not that's done this fiscal year or the following fiscal year, I just know that right now with the finance committee and some of the items that's been discussed around town is that a lot of their employees feel as though they're not very valued and a wage classification study in some fashion would show the commitment that the town has to making sure that their uh, employees are compensated fairly and or acknowledge what their role is and what their compensation should be and then give uh, the Board of Selectmen as well as the town uh, a blueprint as to where we should be going and how we should be doing that. Okay. So we haven't fulfilled obligations under prior grants. Which grants are those? So and that and that acts as a what a impediment or some hindrance to us getting or being eligible for any future money. So it seems to me they ought to get the job done. So we there were right? agreed. There are grants from back. Uh, one of them is from 2013, and the other one is from 2014. So before my time here. So I'm just trying to get the contracts in order, confirm with the state that they can release the additional monies and get them spent, close out the project as soon as possible. I've been in touch with DOR, and I have been working on it. I got one of them pretty much ready to go. Um, so it's just it's just a process to try and get that completed. I understand, but it sounds to me like we can't get any new funds until we rectify the old fund problems, and 13 and 14 seems like uh, many moons ago. For the community compact, that is correct. Board. No, what are they on there? 15, yeah. A couple yeah. years back. Pretty close. No. We did a great job back then in my day. Okay, does somebody want to make a motion or use uh, those funds? I'll make a motion, motion to use um, 51700 for of the ARPA funds for the police cruiser and an additional 30000 for a wage classification study. I'll second. That. Motion and a second for the discussion. Yes. Yeah, I thought we had, um, I don't know, for some reason I, I had a figure of 16-8 running around in my head for this wage study that was like the, you know, the gold standard. There was one that priced like halfway, but it was, you know, kind of a shady, so a, shoddy kind of thing. So that's the, so there's a firm that did the one for Merrimack that had just be, like what, what, what Chairman Watson was saying was focused on more of the wage comparison. 
Um, and then the Collins Center had more of the actual development of the job classifications themselves, the different grades and their responsibilities. And so that was the higher one. So the other one came in around $10,000 and this one was around 30 with the additional uh, scope of services. Okay. What was I thinking of for around 16? I don't know. I only had the two. I, I, I can solicit additional quotes. No, I mean, if we're going to do it and we have other people's money to do it, we might as well get the best. One way to look at it. Okay, ask a question about the cruiser. Go. Cool. Don't we budget at like cycling through a cruiser every year anyways? So if we buy the cruiser, does that take that other cruiser off the line item out of capital expenditures? So it takes or it off of the free cash. Two? So we're opening up free cash. That's exactly the goal for All this right, fiscal so year. All right, so it's a swap. Yeah. Yep. It's not we're getting two. No. No, no. It's a way to play the game. Yes. <laughs> buy the cruiser and free up free cash because we couldn't do it another way. 100%. All right, I like that idea. All right, motion and a second. Any further discussion? None. All in favor? You're, oh, Jason, no, you had no question. I was, I was just jumping ahead to vote. You were, oh, uh, you were jumping right. ahead. Uh, all in favor? Yeah. All right. Unanimous. Uh, next on the agenda. The speed bill. <laughs> uh, request to fly the Ukrainian flag correspondence from Walter uh, Frid Fridvinci, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. If not, I apologize. And Elizabeth Weika. We have some correspondence. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can read that. Uh, this is to formally request that the town of Groven consider flying the Ukrainian flag to show the town's support of Ukraine in their devastating war with Russia. This would be in line with what the cities of Boston, Newburyport, and Haverhill are already doing to display their sympathy and support for the Ukrainian people. We have direct ties to Ukraine with families still there and are very worried not only for their safety, but for all Ukrainian citizens who are unable, unable to leave. We sincerely hope that our town is willing to show s some support for Ukraine. Thank you for considering our request. And that was uh, request to fly the Ukrainian flag. Uh, any uh, comments on that? Uh, anybody? Did they? They gave us a flag, or what's that? Would we have to purchase a flag, or? I uh, know uh, Rebecca has it. Um, my only one. request is, I I I was up at City Hall in Havel today. They don't have it hanging from the flagpole. They ha have it. They have it on a uh, pole uh, connected to the building, uh, and, and I I'd like to see something like that rather than hang it from from a flagpole. We uh, the, the flagpole is pretty full out there. But, yeah, uh, go ahead. I did a little research on this, and it, there's, I don't think it can hang from the same rope as the American flag. Am I understanding that right, the article mm -hmm. that I sent to you? So that's probably why it's on a separate pole, because they didn't have two ropes. They have a fancy word for that rope, but it seemed to be that um, it can't be on the same pole rope. Maybe that's why they got it on the building. Yeah, th I could think so. So if we do something, we, we need to do Do we have another pole? Do we have another flag pole, or do we have a... I really don't out there. I'm sure they could find one. Um, anybody got any other comments? Bill? Uh, 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 Dan? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'd support that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know? And, uh, you know, I... Um, I never thought I'd agree with uh, President Biden on much, but he, when he was talking about a uh, needed regime change, I was like, yeah, it's about time he said something good, you know? <laughs> there you go. Thank you. And then he walked it back. <sighs> so um, can we, uh, how big is the flag? Um, I'm not certain. Looks like a four by six, maybe? Standard. Yeah, well, four, probably four by six. Is it something that could be hung in the window as opposed to, I, I don't know if there's another flagpole out there that not being used and I I, I believe uh, Kathy is correct that I don't think we can hang that with the American flag on the same pole on the same you can't, you can't. It's not the pole, right. I think can't. it's the rope. So, so hang it on another pole. <laughs> you don't have another pole. <laughs> we'll get one. We'll get one. 
But well, hang it. Uh, put it, get a bracket and hang it. Uh, hang it inside the building. Like Great. Uh, so. Slickman McDonald is going to supply the check that's going to buy the poll. And uh, how much, I don't know what the label will cost, but I'm sure he's going to agree to pay for that, too. I could look into it. I actually have two flag companies for clients. I'll make a phone call, see if I can get a poll somewhere, right? How much time do I got? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you need. When the war's Whatever over, I need. When the war's over, what do we hang on it then? We'll put a POW flag up. We'll put something up. We commemorate a lot of things in this country. How about a uh, a, a, a uh, the um, don't tread on me flag? I got one of those. I'll donate to the town. <laughs> Hang it in my basement, the man cave. All right, we want to take a vote to the motion. Jason, Jason wanted to speak. Ed. Jason. Yeah, the only the only uh, request I make is to make sure that we do it properly, with respect, because I know that there's a lot of rules on hanging flags. There is. Um, so, Dan. When you reach out to those flag companies? I'll ask. Ask. Yes, please. No, it's respectful. The flag, a lot of people died for the American flag. I was sympathetic to people in Ukraine, obviously, but there's protocol, and I understand that. I'll try to be sensitive to that. I don't want to make mistakes on that issue. You know, there's certain ways of folding a flag. There's certain ways of putting a flag away. It's ceremonial. It's symbolic, but, you know, there's uh, reasons for that. Appreciate it. Maybe you could get together with Rebecca after you get... Uh information I'll on. see what I can do. Sure. See if I can get a flagpole. I don't know if it's going to be as nice as the ones out there, but I'm trying to find something. <laughs> okay. In if, the not, in, if not, maybe we can cut down a tree in town forest or something. What do you think, Mike? In, in the interim, can we hang it in, in the in the in the the we'll window get a pole. somehow to display it? Well, I think that goes to what Jason just said that you want to, it wants to be done properly and uh, yeah, with, with the right, right, right respect. There's rules. I'm just thinking that could take. Weeks, months. Could get yourself into some hot water. We'll spend um, three weeks trying to figure out where to let, put let, it. Let's let's do it. I I think we should do it right. Do you need us to vote this? Well, if we get a, if we get an, an argument with the Ukrainian embassy, I mean, we'll take it down. Oh, uh, we'll be okay. That's what I think. All right. So, uh, we'll give a motion to. Uh, let Dan take a look at it and get back to Rebecca and properly hang it. Project with Rebecca. Looking forward to working with you, Rebecca. All right. Motion. So many motion. I'll make a motion that uh, select McDonald um, uh, do all the legwork to find out what's required uh, to properly uh, fly the Ukrainian flag on town property and report back to Rebecca what he finds. A motion in a second. Fr friendly amendment. <laughs> Once I do all this, I'd like permission to just go, just go make it happen. Go ahead. You'll show up one day and there'll be a flag flying. Uh, no. You and Rebecca will handle that. I agree. No. No, you won't want me digging the hole, getting the sack read out in the no, five-gallon bucket. It should be, I don't think it should be a pre-standing pole. I mean, we got two flag flag poles out there, and uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like to see it from. Uh, a bracket from the building, and that, that can't cost too much. Well, that's easy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was a motion. I don't know. Was there a second? Yes, there was. And a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Town administrator time. Rebecca, do you have anything? Just uh, three quick things. Uh, one is sure. that the town was successful in receiving a Safe Routes to School grant for sidewalks along Center Street, starting at School Street and up towards um, Ash, uh, Atwood Estates. Um, so we are uh, in the process of doing 10% design with the state on that, and that can go up to a million dollars. So uh, we are very grateful for the opportunity, and hopefully everything goes smoothly. Uh, additionally, just to let the Board of Selectmen know, is that the town has started to do some internal uh, reorganization. Uh, the Water and Sewer Department is looking to vacate the, the current office and move into their new space within the next month or so. Um, so we have started the process of doing some shifting internally. Um, and then also to let you know that I received uh, correspondence from Senator Tarr's office. Uh, specifically asking for any additional requests for the general appropriations bill that they're going to be putting forward. And I just wanted to share with the Board of Selectmen that I will be trying to support the um, items that were brought up by the Massachusetts Municipal Association dealing with the Chapter 70 school aid, um, the local aid, um, and some of their other um, local aid efforts that were less than adequate in terms of what 
local municipalities really need in this particular economic climate. This is, is this a wish list? I hope it's more than that, but essentially. Bill? You asked them about the 100% transportation re reimbursement that district schools are supposed to get by law, but we've never, ever once received 100% reimbursement? I have the transportation listed, yes. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, what else did you have? Nope, that's it. Oh, oh I, I do have one. I, I knew that. Sorry, one item not reasonably anticipated when you get to that. Okay. Uh, selectman's time. Uh, we'll start this side. Dan? Yeah, last uh, meeting we had, uh, we listened to the uh, superintendent in the school district about the um, proposed uh, Prop 2.5 overrides for the next three years. Um, <clears throat> I listened carefully, and I didn't hear anything about impact on the taxpayers. And uh, I think a lot of consideration ought to be given to those people that in, in town that have uh, fixed income and limited means. And uh, people should... Uh, um, think hard about whether or not it's worth it, you know, and whether or not those people can afford it and should have to sacrifice. Um, seems like the budget's expansionary. Um, Superintendent mentioned, um, you know, it was never a good time, you know. Well, this sometimes are worse than others. I think we ha we're in the time that's worse than others. Uh, there's a lot of fi financial anxiety. Um, people I talk to daily. And uh, we should wait and see before we start spending, you know, $9 million over a three-year period to expand the uh, school budget. I think that timing's off. I think the school committee should reconsider. Uh, I think there is a disconnect with what's going on um, locally, financially. And uh, to some degree, I think the, uh, the school districts um, are just, uh, just out of touch. Thank you. Okay, Bill, do you have anything? I find myself in an odd position of concurring with uh, Selectman McDonald that when school enrollment uh, student goes down, headcount should follow and not go up. So it's um, it's rather confusing and frustrating that we see um, things going in opposite directions when they should kind of be in line with each other. So that's about it. Kathy. Um, yeah, so I just had two things. One is um, along the lines of the um, school budget and the communication. I reached out to Dr. Bartholomew and asked for him to reconvene the uh, Regional Agreement Committee, and he did agree to that. He says it can meet at any time. But <laughs> I think it's going to be take it, the towns are going to have to initiate that committee, and I, I can't remember exactly who is on it. I know that. The, usually the finance directors or town administrators are on it. And typically, uh, I thought a finance board member and perhaps a member of the Board of Selectmen, but at the time when that committee met at our regular basis, it was a very, very good thing because it kept in touch with the school and the budgets and the town budget. So it was a good exchange. So I think that reconvening that committee is, is critical. And the second thing, I just wanted to um, run it by my board members. I'm kind of interested right now to take a look at the trash bills for the last six months, if that's okay with everybody, and just see how we're, how we're trending now that we've reduced the barrels and hopefully see an increase in our recycling tonnage. Don't, don't say it to me. I know, I might be disappointed, but I want to see. Yeah, but I didn't want to just go off the rails and do it without saying if it's all right with everybody if I do that. You just don't have six months' worth of data yet because we just started on February 1st. Right. No, but I want to go back before, so I want to see the trend. I don't want to use the pandemic time. I want to use this time, yeah. kind of more normalized time. And, and I'm also curious, like, with the, um, with the world economy, what's happening to the pricing on uh, recycling? I'm kind of curious because it's like a commodities thing. Yep. Yeah, and I, and I just wanted to start. I don't think we, we track that every month, and it's kind of important to our, our trash contract. I. I looked at the last variance report, and I thought maybe we weren't going to make it on that budget this year. I was a little worried. She's, she's smiling at me. Yeah, Kathy, it's not looking good. Okay, so that's why another reason. I'm with you. It would be nice to see three months on each side of the February 1st 
you know, data to see how it really trended. Right, right. So um, I didn't. I know we have. We don't like to bother other departments, but in order to get that data, I have that data, so I Gosh. can share that data with you. you. Okay, great. You get it for the next meeting. Uh, yes. Very good. Super. Maybe you could get it to do it before, so everybody can look it over. Yep, I'll send it. It's in an Excel spreadsheet, and you can sort it by year. Okay. Uh, year? Jason, you. <laughs> Jason, you have anything on the second no. time? Um, I don't. I don't have anything. Uh, older unfinished business. I don't think we have anything there. Uh, we do have something under uh, other items not reasonably anticipated. Yes, sorry, Mr. Chair, this just came in. Um, we had a board member resign from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, they haven't met in a little while, or almost a year, actually. Uh, but they do have a variance application before them, and they are required to have uh, five members. And they've requested if there would be a board of selectmen member that could be appointed. Um, the only reason, again, it's a little urgent is because the, it's scheduled for April 6th, and our next meeting for the Board of Selectmen is until April 14th. Okay, anybody, uh, well, where, do you know where the uh, uh, variance is for so that uh, nobody has a conflict? I believe it's on, um, I want to say Bear Hill Road. Jeez, that's too close to me. That shouldn't affect anybody. Yeah. Well, I live down the street from that. Oh, yeah. It, it will. <laughs> it won. Uh, Jason, uh, would you hand up for a volunteer? Yes. I thought so. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a vote. Uh, we need a mo motion to uh, appoint Jason to the... Uh, uh, Do we appoint him or make him temporary? What is the uh, temporary, uh, temporary appointment. For one uh, meeting? Alternate. Uh, we can make him an alternate, permanent. No, I don't think you want to do that because well, you got an election. You got an election he's, coming he's up. He's saying so, yes. Uh, I, I, I don't have a problem with that because we got an election I coming do. up in a um, uh, in, in a. If he's an right alternate, he go to all the meetings. It would just be until June thirtieth, and so we'd have to reappoint. All right, as long as he doesn't mind. I don't mind. So okay. I'll make uh, a motion. June thirtieth, twenty twenty-three. Uh, Jason, how's that? <laughs> so a motion. We need a motion for that. Motion to appoint Jason Naves as an alternate zoning board member. Nice. Um, Effective immediately until June 30th, 2022. Second. Motion and a second. Further discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you, Jason. Uh, actually, four, zero. Abstain. Jason, abstain. Uh, <laughs> correspondence. Uh, letter from the police chief uh, uh, thanking us for the generosity on the American Rescue Plan Act. And we have a uh, uh, another correspondence about... Uh, a training program Tuesday, March 29th, 7 to 9, and another session March 31st, 9 a.m. to 11. Uh, Stop the bleed, uh, save a life. That'll be at the Groveland Fire Department on the Tuesday, and the 9 to 11 will be at the town hall, Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, <coughs> motion to adjourn. Motion I make a motion to adjourn at 9 12 p.m. Uh, second. A second. Uh, all in favor? Unanimous. And the next meeting will be Monday, April 14th, yep. 6.30. Thank you.